Oops, sorry there folks, this uh, screencast-o-matic lecture capture system shuts down after 15 minutes, so my cup runneth over. Speaking of cups, let me pick right up on the topic here and then get into part three. This is essentially part three. But we're talking about the feather glass problem in the concrete operational child. If we talk about you hit a glass with a hammer, it'll break. That's concrete. They understand that. That's their experience. But we change it up, and then we say, if you hit a glass with a feather, it'll break. Don hit a glass with a feather. What happened? Well, the uh, and this is where we got cut off. The concrete operational child will look at you like you're nuts. So they'll insist nothing happens, and you ask, why? And the child says, because a feather is soft, and, and a glass is relatively harder that a feather could possibly break a, break a glass goes against their concrete experience. It goes against our concrete experience too, doesn't it? But they don't understand that this is a hypothetical abstract type of problem in a make-believe world. And as silly as the assumption is, if you hit a glass with a feather it'll break, that according to the rule, and that's what we're playing by, the glass would break if you hit it with a feather. But on average, by about 11, 11 or 12, the older child going through tremendous accommodation is starting to master hypothetical and abstract thinking. Piaget says the child moves into the fourth and the final stage of cognitive development called the formal operational stage, which we'll nickname as the period of adolescence. The young adolescent can now apply logical thought to abstract, verbal, hypothetical problems, not just in the present, but in the past and in the future. The adolescent can now solve the feather glass problem. Piaget says that cognitive development is over with now, and the adolescent thinks like an adult. And that's the basics of Piaget's theory of cognitive development. And this was to be the end of part two to finish up. Now we start on part three. And this is a short section. The, the key terms here are teratogens, fetal alcohol syndrome, attachment, and Harlow's monkeys. When we look at prenatal development, Plenty of things can go wrong during the normal development of a baby in the womb. And a growing body of research suggests risk factors increase with mother's advancing age in her 40s, high levels of unmanaged stress or risk factors, and poor nutrition. And then we have the issue of teratogens, which we define as harmful agents which can cause a negative impact on prenatal development. We have three big subtypes of teratogens, and these include diseases, toxins, and drugs. And it's this third subtype of teratogens, drugs, that I want to make some remarks over because they can be especially dangerous. Now, heroin, cocaine, crack, and even cigarette smoking it can all lead to premature delivery with low birth weight, birth defects, fetal death, and, and outright miscarriage. But the teratogen that we know more about than any other is, what do you think? Alcohol. Alcohol crosses the placental barrier, and women who drink heavily during pregnancy risk having children with fetal alcohol syndrome. Fetal alcohol syndrome, or FAS for short, is associated with mild mental retardation, and there's a characteristic facial appearance featuring wide set eyes and a short nose, among others. That said, is there a safe level of alcohol that a pregnant woman can drink without risking harm to her fetus? I mean, after all, drinking one or two glasses of wine, 
with your evening meal has been associated with good cardiovascular health. What do you think? No. The United States Surgeon General has said safe levels have not been established. And so the recommendation is to abstain totally from alcohol during pregnancy. Also, and this is also and this is scary too, women who have drank light or moderate levels of alcohol have given birth to babies with FAS features, just stopping short of the full blown syndrome. So you see the truth is if you want to become pregnant, you should discuss with your doctor all the drugs that you're taking, including recreational, over-the-counter, prescription, and certainly any illicit substances. Your physician will almost certainly advise you to, to stop taking any drugs of abuse, including alcohol. And don't be too surprised if your doctor recommends that you be very careful about taking drugs that are over the counter because of the possible teratogenic effects of those. For the final major topic in chapter 8, this short part 3, we'll discuss attachment defined as a strong affectionate bond that the baby forms with mother or the primary caretaker. Mother is usually the primary caretaker. And everybody knows that this, this can be a very strong, intense bond, can't it? But what is the glue that binds baby and mother together? How does this happen? For the longest time, the prevailing thinking was that it was food and nourishment. And since mother is primarily associated with these, the baby forms a bond with her. But Harry Harlow, and this is Harlow pictured here, a psychologist at the University of Wisconsin, <coughs> excuse me, disagreed and embarked on a research program to prove otherwise. Harlow raised rhesus monkeys in his primate lab, and when babies were born, he immediately turned them into orphans at birth, never to see their mothers again. These monkeys were raised in cages, totally isolated from one another, and they had no interaction with other monkeys, with living beings, except humans, when it came time for feeding. And to this end, this is the heart of the research, Harlow constructed surrogate or substitute mothers to provide feeding at specified times. Some monkeys were randomly assigned to be fed by a wire mesh monkey mother, exactly like the one you see here. And others were randomly assigned to be fed by a terry cloth mother, just like the one you see here. Now the dependent variable of interest is who would the monkeys hang out with during free time, and they got some periods of free time, or who would they go to if they were scared or frightened? Most experts predicted that the choice would be the mother who fed them, whether it was a cold hunk of metal or the warm, soft, cuddly version. Harlow discovered that all monkeys would run and cling to the terry cloth substitute, even if they were fed by the wire mesh version as you can see right here. Harlow called this need contact comfort and he said it surpasses nourishment in the development of love and attachment to others. Before Harlow it was thought that physical contact with infants might be harmful to their development and that good parents should strive to have as little contact as possible. We're talking about Oh, definitely a hundred years ago, as recently as the 1950s. While it would be criminal to carry out this type of research on humans today, Harlow made his point, and now recommendations for treating our babies in nursery care have done a 360 degree turn 
and acknowledge the importance of contact comfort for normal healthy development. So that's the end of our short section three and of the topics that I want to go over in chapter eight. See you next time in chapter nine. Take care.